صلاة الذي في كل شهر وفي سفر هماني على ماهن مح الحبس والسفر صلاة الذي في كل شهر وفي سفر هماني على ماهن مح الحبس والسفر صلاة كل شهر وفي سفر حماني على ما هن مح الحبس والسفر فلاهي بكوني عبد ربي خديمه عجيب به لي جاد مغن عن النفر رديت صوفي اسلام ويست افريكان صوفي اسلام is not only about idea it's not only about flows, but it's also about sounds, and it's also about colors and forms, and probably it's what signal that, you know, it is an African intervention in Islam. Babu's former supervisor will say that it's sign of how Islam is Africanized. So what we are going to do this, this morning, we'll have first a short presentation of our goal organizing this conference by my colleague, friend, Suleiman Bashir Jan, with whom we have been <coughs> working. So the kind of trio which is uh, which is dealing with Islam, which is dealing with religion, dealing in particular with Sufis, are uh, Karen Baki you have seen yesterday, Suleiman Bashir Jan, and myself. And this is we didn't say it quite clear. This is part of a program we have on Sufis on the global stage. What we intend to do is basically to work on Sufis in Africa, in Europe, and in Asia. And I think in next week we'll have the, 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 uh, a conference also on, on Sufis in, in, in Asia. So this is part of, of this larger project. Uh, Suleiman will actually introduce, uh, you know, the kind of program and the ideas behind, behind the program. And after his introduction, uh, 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 Abdulaziz Mbake will moderate the first session, which is on violence in, and non-violence. We'll have two Panels on violence and non violence. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to say a few introductory uh, words on the second day, which is, as uh, uh, Mamadou just mentioned, <coughs> the first day of the academic uh, uh, side, uh, if we call academic uh, the work of reflection on the, on the topic of Islam and, and peace. So my first words would be a word, words of warm welcome to all of you and words of gratitude for your uh, uh, presence and for accepting our uh, invitation. So um, this is obviously a good time to reflect upon the very question of Islam and peace. This has been mentioned uh, uh, yesterday, which was also the anniversary of 9-11, 14 years later. And this is exactly what we are doing here in our project with IRCPL, reflect on Islam and peace, uh, the complexities of the religion and uh, uh, politics of Sufism in uh, uh, particular. Uh, the case can certainly be made that uh, uh, Islamic philosophy in general or Sufi doctrine more particularly 
is pluralism, is tolerance, is non-violence. This is on the doctrine uh, uh, side. And the magnificent exhibition that we have all around us uh, 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 showing uh, uh, important moments of the life of Serin Tuba, Sheikh Ahmad Bamba, is a testimony to the philosophy of non-violence that the Sheikh, uh, uh, um, the Murid Sheikh of Senegal, opposed to colonial violence and Perfect. successfully. But speaking of colonialism, it is also, and this should be emphasized, a simple fact that Sufi brotherhoods and Shuyukh and Sheikhs took arms also and fought either jihads to convert people or against colonialism. To give a few examples, the Emir Abdel Qadr of Algeria fought against the French while writing Sufi poetry on universal law. And eventually, he came to have an agreement with French colonialism, put down his arms and weapons, and was exiled in Iraq, where he spent the rest of his life near the shrine of his beloved spiritual leader and uh, uh, namesake, uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jailani. So these are two sides of the same Sufi Sheikh taking arms, fighting colonialism, and also meditating next to the shrine of one of the greatest Sufi sheikh of all uh, 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 time. Another example would be one of two brothers from the same Sufi background, one who fought against colonialism in Western Sahara, and one who found a path of accommodation with colonial France. Obviously, the first one is Sheikh Maal Aini, and the second, Sheikh Na Sheikh Sadbu. Last but not least of those examples, it could be mentioned that the Sufi Brotherhood of the Tijaniya, uh, uh, the uh, um, Sufi path uh, founded by, by Sheikh Na uh, uh, Sheikh Abu Abbas Ahmad al Tijani, presents both the face of armed resistance in Algeria and in West Africa with the jihad of Sheikh Umar Tal al-Futi, and that of nonviolent accommodation uh, which manifested itself by the declaration of Sheikh Haj Maliksi when he declared, my only weapons is my rosary. Our project in IRCPL, in the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, examines that complexity of Sufi religion and politics beyond general and in the end hollow statements such as Islam is peace, Sufism is peace, etc. You can say those statements, they are not false, but as we say in French, they eat no bread. Ça ne mange pas de pain. That is to say, they remain somehow hollow because, because obviously we have to take uh, full account of the fact that in certain circumstances, certain historical periods and regions have, been, uh, 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 have witnessed uh, Sufis uh, uh, being uh, uh, armed uh, um, fighters, warriors, and bringing violence and uh, destruction. Obviously, and this is a Sufi saying, the Sufi is the child of waqt, of the period, of time, of circumstances. So these circumstances may command that he fights uh, defensive wars or that he meditates next to the shrine of a Sufi spiritual leader. Our project, as I say, takes into full account those kind of complexity. It is also interested in the very doctrine beyond the historical circumstances, in the philosophy which explains why even though in circumstances, in certain circumstances, Sufis have been warriors, overall, Sufism as a philosophy, as a reading of Islam, is a force for peace, for pluralism, for respect for difference, and bears the promise of a dynamic religion in an open society. The philosophy of pluralism is not 
specific to Sufism. It is primarily Islamic in general and Quranic in particular. But it is fair to say that Sufis, more than any other, make it the heart of their world view. Thus, verses that are verses of pluralism that are to be found in the Quran may have a particular resonance with Sufis because precisely they are uh, Sufi. Thus, one famous such verse of pluralism is the one that you find in chapter 5, verse 48 of the Quran, well known, Surah to Maida, verse uh, 48, which says that if God had wanted, he would have made us one single community. Understood? He did not want it. So differences are, in, are normal. They are the normal state of human affairs. And that verse pursues saying that it is only when you come back to him, to God, that he will tell you about your divergences. If you take such a verse seriously, and this is what Sufis do with the Quran, then you understand that differences are natural thing. You not only accept them, you respect them. And you understand that you have always to be holding steadily what you have, what you believe in, and at the same time remain skeptical about you being the only bearer and holder of the truth. And this is what is at the heart of Sufi doctrine. Again, it is Quranic, it is not specific to Sufis, even though Sufis are more likely to take uh, seriously verses like that. So are also the Quranic verses explaining why human beings may be different, but are all one single humanity as they are driven by the force of love. Yesterday, our good friend Musa Diankala had started doing some tafsir of this famous, famous passage which is at the heart of Sufi doctrine, uh, 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 the day of the covenant when God summons all the souls he is going to create and asks them, am I not your Lord? Alas to be rabbikum, and everybody answered then, yes, indeed you are. And Musa Diankala was explaining uh, uh, very nicely that that meant that what constitutes the human being is that primordial consent to God when it was stamped upon her heart that indeed what constitutes her as a human being is that day of covenant. And then we are forgetful. It is said that the very word nas to mean human beings also has to do with forgetfulness. We are forgetfulness. We are forgetful of that day which constitutes us, but at the same time, that is stamped upon our hearts. So we can never truly and fully forget that day. We are still driven by the force of love that was stamped upon us. And what that means is that whatever we are doing, we are still manifestation of that love. And this is the Sufi understanding of verses such as the one I just quoted following Musa Jain Kala. And this would explain why in the end, Sufis have, because of their doctrine, this respect for pluralism, because they are able to recognize beyond any kind of form it takes, even the form of the refusal of God, even the form of atheism, they are still able to recognize the unity of that one driving force that tries to take us back to the day of covenant when we were constituted by our uh, 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 consent to God. Because Sufis understand themselves as the people of precisely remembering beyond forgetfulness, and this is also something that Musa Jankala said yesterday. Sufis understand themselves as the people of dhikr, the people of remembrance, and central to their doctrine would be also a verse which is again Quranic. Sufis are not something different from Muslims in general. The Quranic verse that says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Allah بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ Those who believe and whose hearts find satisfaction in the remembrance of God, for without doubt it is in the remembrance of God that hearts find satisfaction. So with uh, 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 doctrines such as these, with emphasis such, uh, on verses such as these, we can understand why Sufi doctrine beyond, again, historical circumstances, 
uh, is about pluralism, is about tolerance, and is about openness. So to summarize our project, the project we are working on, and we thank you again for joining us in that project. We fully take into account the complexity of Sufi religion and politics. Second, we take fully into account and we have the firm conviction that the doctrine itself carries the promise of a better word, a word of peace and pluralism. Third, we believe firmly that the name of peace central to Islam is education. Education, education. The movie we saw yesterday about uh, the Magal of Tuba and in the quotes that were made of the teaching of uh, uh, Serin Sheikh, uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Bamba is exactly about that. When he mentioned in the movie that his project is to oppose to colonialism, to the violence, violence that colonialism is by its very nature, not a jihad, meaning uh, 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 taking weapons and fighting back, but education and faith. And uh, this gives me the opportunity to mention precisely uh, someone who could not be here, but who, is, who has been sending his uh, uh, greetings and blessings to our conference, which is uh, Sheikh Mamour Mbake Murtala that uh, uh, Abdul Aziz mentioned yesterday, who is so committed Say uh, Professor Jang's uh, uh, statement about the primordial covenant, which is, of course, what Sheikh Ahmadijani is invoking when he speaks about this innate knowledge of the human spirit. Because everybody stood up before their Lord and he said, that none of us is created by his father. And he's expanding on that. He has also the the university which was rebuilt upon the philosophy and an ethics taught by uh, and the demands and the demands of the modern world for the modern I am mentioning this because uh, we at IRCPL have had the pleasure of his visit a few weeks ago and because we are committed Thank you, Marat, and I uh, would like to add my voice to the chorus of thanks and gratitude uh, addressed to Mamadou, uh, Bashir, and Karen, and of course all the staff that did the legwork and made this wonderful uh, encounter possible. Um, the reflections that I'm submitting to you today uh, should be understood as fragments of ongoing intellectual ruminations rather than elaborate thought resulting from the rigorous discursive process. I would like to begin by explaining some core Sufi ideas, values, and practices which I think could be conceived as building blocks for the ideological foundation of a Sufi ethic of pluralism and tolerance. I'm not arguing in favor of an essentialist view of Sufi thought, which would ignore diversity among Sufi thinkers and practitioners or downplay the importance of context. I'm suggesting that, like theoreticians and practitioners of Salafism or that of Marxism or any other system of thought, Sufi also share some basic ideas and beliefs which function as lenses for apprehending and making sense of reality. And contending that it's possible to discern something that could be conceived as shared universal spiritual canvas on which different Sufi experiences molded by different contexts were written over time. So, in this paper, I explore some core ideas and practices which, among others, form the substratum of this canvas. These are the notion of Bajin and Ma'arifa, which combine with a particular understanding of the prophetic experience, inform a unique attitude towards state and society. And in the second section, I use some example from the Senegalese Sufi Sheikh Ahmed Obama to show how these ideas and prophetic inspiration were mobilized 
in the context of 19th century Senegal to bring to the community of believers at a time of rapid political, economic, and social change. Perhaps one of the most significant defining features of Sufism is the distinction between the role of Zahir, the manifest, the external, and that of Bajin, the hidden, the internal. And they believe that by building friendship with God, Sufi can earn the privilege to access and impact the world of Bajin. The Sufi emphasis on Bajin has important theological and organizational implications. And perhaps the most consequential of these implications is the suggestion that God can be known through other means than the divine revelation enshrined in the Quran. Because the word of Bajin does not obey itself to discursive scrutiny. Sufi theology then tend to favor universalist perception of Islam that puts an emphasis on sameness rather than particularist futures that an exotic and legalist reading of Islam would encourage. This is what Rumi, for example, expressed, and I'm referring here to Jalanja al Rumi, expressed when he observed that there is an inner world of freedom where thought are too subtle to be judges. And in line with this argument, another Sufi writer note, when God is comprehended and actually, theological differences arise, but when he is approached devotionally, everything dissolves in, into his being and differences are wiped out. This argument is even more compelling when related to the centrality of the persona of Prophet Muhammad in Sufi thought and practice. All Sifsila, regardless of Tariqa affiliation, lead Prophet Muhammad, who is the ultimate guide to a genealogy of saint equally revered by all Sufis. But the sameness induced by the lack of discursive engagement is only apparent. Devotional approach to God does not eliminate differences. Indeed, uh, Sufi ritual can be and are often source of division. And, uh, but it's important to note that the kind of division that this devotional approach creates. One of the implications of diversity is actually linguistic. And that is in many Muslim communities <clears throat> where Islam has brought the Arabic script, the Arabic script has been modified to convey the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith to the local masses. And as a linguist interested in African societies, my interest is the interactions, the interplays, which I call enrichment. How, uh, for example, in this case, we will see that the concept of suffering, which already existed in the world of society, <clears throat> captured in um, proverbs and maxims like Moon <clears throat> has blended with the concept of suffering and patience of sabr, repeated in the Quran and in the teachings. And I think these texts offer us uh, a window into local means of conflict resolutions. And I hope by the end of this presentation, we will uh, have an idea and, uh, of the rich tradition of diversity. Uh, conveyed through these vernacular, vernacular texts. Uh, so in the world of tradition, uh, the concept of suffering, kumun mun, whoever perseveres will end, end up smiling, is a very important concept and suffering is a, uh, a requirement for success, for exploits. And the tradition of suffering is used in training children in the educational system and is found across West Africa. But this tradition is also, has also counterparts in Islam. As we know, al-sabr is a fundamental concept in the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith. 
So what I call sanctified suffering is enduring hardship with perseverance in righteousness. And it's a common response to violence. And in many cases, and, uh, that's the reason why the celebrations of the narrative of Shia Ahmed Bamba, the most important and celebrated section, really, is the section in which he suffered the most. It is the section of the exile to uh, Gabon. And why is that? It's because suffering is regarded when conducted with virtue as a, as a means to be elevated to higher levels. Such suffering is understood, therefore, as trials of friends of God, as means to earn special privileges, including promotions and devotion, and, and uh, promotion or exoneration. In the Ajami sources, uh, especially of, Bucha, of Musaka, penned in Wolof, which I am sure have parallels in among the Hausa, the Fulbe, <coughs> and others, the sainthood really of Shah Bamba is tied with his enduring suffering without erring, erring without uh, losing his focus in his quest for spiritual and ethical excellence. And it's actually the success of that suffering that he is regarded as, as, as the basis of his reward, of his exceptional sainthood. So what I will do in this talk is to look at this poem called Nato di Kerkerani Auliyal, which Musaka wrote in a particular situation of conflict in which the community, the post-Bamba, when Bamba died in 1927, the community faced a leadership crisis. And the Mbake family was somewhat divided. And uh, Sher Anta Mbake was deported to uh, a Segu. It is within this context to diffuse the tension, to remind the community of the essential teachings of Bamba, that Musaka as an elder uh, and the most respected voice of the Murid community decided that he was going to use <coughs> his pen to write about the importance of sanctifying. And what he did is, is remarkable. <coughs> what he did is remarkable. He really historicized suffering. And uh, he wrote this poem, and I will let you listen a little bit of it. that is significant to hear is the combination of different media of communication to reach the masses. So you have the audio dimension, and then you have the written dimension. <clears throat> and this has significant literacy implications. One of them that is often missed is that it has triggered what could be referred to as music-derived literacy. So that the literacy here that is acquired is not necessarily based on reading. It's based on memorizing verses first, and then reading, uh, uh, studying how to decipher the script. And I think that's a very important uh, area that deserves uh, attention. Uh, but, but additionally, what is what is key in this in these poems is that you have you have blendings of different sorts of of, of knowledge systems. You have blendings of the 
traditional war of culture, features of the war of culture, and Islamic teachings. Okay. And this is uh, written in a way that it, it, it could be understood to the, uh, by the masses through use of metaphors and uh, other techniques. So this is an example just to give you about, uh, 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 this is a picture I, I took in New York. And here again, I just wanted to show you the importance of uh, suffering that is often uh, missed, I think, uh, in the story of Shah Amud Bamba. In the academic narratives, of course, we know about the history of Amud Bamba. But the significance of suffering that is emphasized across Ajami sources, uh, Babu has spent wonderful uh, pages in, uh, on the issue of suffering. But I think the suffering is actually, for the murid, it's actually the suffering that is the price he had to pay. Uh, the suffering that he opted to choose as a response to uh, unjustified violence is actually what was rewarded. And it is that reward that made him uh, a saint of, of exceptional stature among the murids. And I think that's very important. So in this context, what happened is Sheikh Antoine Bakke, who was regarded as, by the French as uh, l'éternel agitateur du Bawol, <laughs> because he was, uh, he was very wealthy and uh, was central in the dispute that uh, erupted after Bamba's death, uh, <clears throat> was the subject of this poem. Musaka was also his friend. And Musaka had to do something to address that crisis to avert violence, but also to bring back the community to the essential teachings of Shia Ahmed Bamba. So what we see here is violence or challenges are not responded by fighting back or turning the other cheek. In fact, violence here is responded by enduring it and focusing on perseverance in excellent ethical and spiritual behavior. So, um, the concept of mun then has blended with the concept of sabr so that when you were suffering or when you were enduring hardship, you were not really uh, told to fight back, but you were told to persevere because you were told that the more you persevere and the more you excel, the greater your reward. And that's what exactly Musaka did. So he composed the poem. The, compo the poem is a very long poem. And uh, he historicizes suffering. He begins with uh, the suffering of the Abrahamic prophets, the sufferings of Jesus, the suffering of uh, Abraham, the suffering of Job, the suffering of Jacob. He begins from the core prophets and saints that Islam shares with the monotheist religions, Christianity and Judaism. And he goes back to, from there, he goes to uh, the suffering of Prophet Muhammad, and then the suffering of the Khulafa or Rashidun, the uh, rightly guided uh, caliphs, and then he goes from there to the suffering of uh, West African uh, leaders, and from there he goes to the suffering of Shia Ahmadu Bamba, and then etc. etc. until he reaches uh, the point where he talks about the, suff the deportation of his friend Shia Anta to Segu. So what we learn here, we learn a great deal of knowledge that's actually rooted in the classical Islamic sources. And we see that, in fact, these scholars are actually very eclectic. And they draw from both the Quranic and liturgical Islamic sources and their own traditional values. The prologue, the, the poem has about seven sections. Uh, I've talked about this. As customary in Muslim writings, Musaka begins with an opening doxology or formula in Arabic, uh, using local metaphors drawn from the Quran and Sufi sources and Bamba's teachings. He lays down his objectives to remind the community of the virtues of Bamba's, uh, the virtues that Bamba championed, which is suffering and perseverance in righteousness in the, in the face of misfortune, uh, sorry, and to diffuse the tension in the community. Uh, to represent uh, to, and present Sheikh Anta as a saint uh, who has to earn his status with strength, uh, with suffering uh, like his predecessors. 
He actually repeats certain words. So we find certain words like uh, uh, the word natu, the word mun, the word bala. And we can see here, you have basically key elements of the local wall of moral philosophy that would, uh, that Asan Silla would call part of the wall of moral philosophy are actually blending with the counterparts in, in Islam. Okay? So Natu, uh, Bala, okay? Sabr, and Mun. Uh, and of course he uses metaphors that could, that could be, that people could relate to, uh, including the Mbur. Uh, the saints uh, have become Mbur. Because the wrestlers, uh, the wrestling arena is conceptualized as an arena of demonstration of both physical and supernatural potency. And therefore, it makes sense in most of the writings of local poetry to see uh, Mur being used as a saint, okay? both in Tijaniya, Muridiya, and other traditions. So what he wants his audience really to do is to understand or to construe Shah Anta's trials, deportation, as, as really uh, the price to pay to become a saint. Okay. He refers to this group as the group of the, uh, uh, the, the Ahl al-Bala, the people who are said to have uh, great rewards in the afterlife, rewards that many people will envy. By framing Sheikh Anta's exile in this way, Carr takes away the agency from the colonial administration that deported uh, Sheikh Anta, but also from the opposing parties, because in the end, no one is blamed. <laughs> uh, no one is blamed. God is the primary agent. The shift of agency, okay, the shift of agency from a temporal to a spiritual agent is very common in Murid narratives, and it has several effects. It produces an imagined disempowerment and demystification of agents of temporal power colonial officers and their local agents, and strengthens trust in God. It enhances the prestige of Sheikh Anta as a budding saint who's divinely selected, uh, who was divinely selected for a promotion. Uh, I don't have time to go through this. I've been shown that I only have five minutes, but uh, uh, I could come back to these uh, elements if asked later. Uh, I will just wrap up on these things. You have here also the sufferings of a major Abrahamic prophet. And the sufferings, are, the stories are told in the same way they narrated in the Quran, with the poignancy and, 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 and the sadness. But his goal is actually to use them as models of, of perseverance. They never gave up, despite the injustice, despite the, uh, 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 the amount of suffering they endured. They remained focused on their ethical and spiritual quest. And that's actually the basis for him of any success with material and immaterial benefits. Okay. Uh, jump again here. He, he basically uh, traces uh, the history of suffering in Islam and uh, other traditions and demonstrates that all, this, all the features that one key feature that all the saints share, share we, is that they never, they never went astray, regardless of the, uh, of the degree of suffering they endured. Uh, of course, he goes through the suffering of Ahmadu Bamba, using different types of metaphors uh, to localize it, comparing Bamba to the prophet Muhammad, poet using uh, poetic techniques like Ahmad al-Bakiyu, uh, compared to Ahmad al makiyu All of these found resonance with the local communities. Uh, the suffering of Sheikh Anta under colonial, French colonial administration. When Sheikh Anta came back from, uh, from, from uh, Segu, he wrote another poem in which he presents Sheikh Anta as a successful saint now. That Sheikh Anta has now gone to, has passed the trial. Has, has gone to uh, Segu and came back now. He, he went as a budding saint, a saint and is now a full-fledged saint because he has endured the suffering. Uh, he, 
he presents him as the heir of, the, of Bamba, just as Bamba suffered, uh, he had to suffer. He enjoined his audience to remain composed in the face of the collective distress and bewilderment for Sher Anta had the resources to, 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 to make the best of his misfortunes. And this is the epilogue. In the final part of the poem, he draws again on his native pre-Islamic tradition of celebrate, celebrating the perseverance of mothers in the face of hardship as the benefit uh, of, their, uh, to their, uh, of, of this to their offspring. And this makes me think of the wall of phrase Ligue Yunde Anubdo. That the success of the child is often attributed uh, to the suffering again of the mother. So suffering becomes again, even for, for all members of society, as the spiritual investment to make for women to beget successful children. And so that's why he congratulates uh, Sher Anta's mother for enduring suffering that made it possible to bring to this world such a great hero. Uh, in conclusion, I, I, I think uh, I'm running out of time here. Drawing on the Quran, he analogizes the French colonial authorities as agents of Satan who plants the seed of division among his people and highlights the flip-flopping of the hypocrites he found in, his, in the society. And uh, he prays for Sher Anta's returns home safely uh, and his family. He ends up the Pope with, with a murid we have, a, we have a doxology, we have a prayer in Arabic as customary in Islamic writing. And his last words, he prays for a collective purification from immorality, the roots of all human ills in the teachings of the Muridiyya. So finally, what we see is really uh, the effects are tangible. According to many Murid scholars, when he came back, uh, he achieved, Kah Musaka achieved his objectives. He diffused the tension that erupted within the Murid community and presented Sheikh Anta as a leader who earned his sainthood status with suffering and virtue. Sheikh Anta returned home in 1934, and uh, the Murid community was reconciled under the leadership of Sheikh Modu Mustafa Mbake, the oldest son of Bamba. Kai emphasizes how Sheikh Anta, Sheikh Anta's return, reconciled the opposing parties within and outside the community. They all got along including the colonial administration. Musaka wrote another poem entitled Ndagam Borom, Borom Darussalam, honoring the master of, of Darussalam, Sheikh Anta, in which he celebrates Sheikh Anta as a return, uh, Sheikh Anta's return as an accomplished saint who shared the rewards of his sanctified suffering with the entire community, as the following metaphors illustrate. And I will stop right there, maybe with this met nice metaphor. You left as a star, arrived in Segu as a moon, and came back home as a bright sun that enlightens all of us. And uh, I will be happy to take questions later, but uh, I didn't have time to go through all the materials. But the central point here is the blending, in fact, of the local elements of the wall of moral philosophy, concept of moon, uh, concepts of Liga um, Yunde uh, Dog, that have been sanctified or elevated into religious obligation within the Muridiyya by blending them with fundamental Islamic teachings of supper. Okay. That's all I had to say. Uh, maybe hopefully I will be able to have a other question. Thank you very much, Professor Falungom, for your brilliant speech. So we will let uh, Professor Mbai Bashir Lo present his paper entitled he had as a peace tradition in the writings of Sheikh Musa Kamara. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Professors Bashir uh, uh, and Professor Mamadou Youf, and uh, actually uh, the staff of uh, IRCPL. They were extremely helpful. Uh, I'm delighted to try to contribute in this discourse uh, within uh, a framework outside the work of Sheikh Ahmed Bamba. Uh, Professor Bashir is right that uh, there are outliers 
when we argue about the centrality of peace with Sufism, but the argument of this paper is that it's true, but in its generality, peace has been the central argument of Sufism. So my paper, I'll just read uh, through it in order for us to be able to maximize the time that is in front of us. One of the fundamental messages of Islamic teaching is Salam, peace, and Islam, surrendering to Islam. However, recent development of political Islam, and most importantly, the rise of militant Islam, have widely challenged the authenticity of this Islamic value. Recently, the location of peace within the concept of jihad has been a center of popular and intellectual scrutiny in many corners of the world. This paper uses the work of Sheikh Musa Kamara, 1864 to 1945, one of the most prolific Muslim Sufi scholars of the 20th century to highlight aspects of jihad's non-violence intellectual traditions in Africa. Sheikh Musa Kamara's treatise on jihad, entitled in Arabic, Aksar al-Raghibina fil jihad, بَعْدَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِمَّنْ يَخْتَارُونَ الظُّهُورَ وَمِلْكَ الْعِبَادِ وَلَا يُبَعْلُونَ بِمَنْ هَلَكَ فِي جِهَادِهِ مِنَ الْعِبَادِ A very long title of a book. To translate this just title, those who are mostly interested in jihad, choosing appearance and ownership of God's slave, slaves, do not care about those people who perish in their jihad. So that is the, the translation of the title of the book. This book is an original contestation against the virtue of physical jihad, also known as jihad by the sword. The treaty examines the prophetic meanings of jihad and the danger in utilizing jihad beyond its prophetic and spiritual parameters. Sheikh Kamara perceived politics to be a self-serving arena for those within the end, within for those with interest in leadership and fame. And therefore, he argued, any call for jihad within the political context can only be self-serving and power-mongering pretense of dominance. In this view, using jihad as a means of imposing change or gaining power cannot certainly be an impetus for the peace message of Islam. This paper examines the socio-political context of this treaty its content as well, and its relevance to the recent discourse on peace and jihad. And the recent uh, discourse, basically, um, as I, we try to sum it up in this here, from Professor Bernard Lewis' 1989 uh, article, The Roots of the Muslim Rage, to Huntington's Class of Civilization, to the two vocabulary in the 21st century of war on terror and the new war thesis. If you look at this, one must admit that the rise of militant Islam is the root cause of this development because the application of jihad is the sole motive of the three spiritual founders of this militant group. Isa Sayyid al Qutb, Muhammad Abdul Salam Farah, and Ben Laden. If you look at the work of these three, uh, Sayyid al Qutb's work, whether it is Fizilali al Quran in the shadow of the Quran or uh, signposts on the road, the argument of centrality of jihad in Islam is the dominant argument. If you look at Muhammad Abdul Salam Farah, his uh, 1991 uh, book, Al Farid al Ghaib, the, missed, the Missing Obligation, which reduced Islam into the act of jihad. If we look at Ben Laden's two uh, manifesto, Jihad, Manifesto of 1996, the Declaration of Jihad against America and its allies, or <coughs> 1998, uh, the, the Declaration of Jihad and the Foundation of Al-Qaeda, it centralized Islam, reduced Islam to jihad. So how did the Muslim, the global scholarship responses responded to this. 
scholars' viewpoints regarding the ongoing viol violence involving militant Islam jihad have not been one-sided. Some have embarked in influencing Western public opinion on Islam through one of, of two aspects, exposing the Islamophobic orientation of post-9-1-1 culture or demonstrating militant Islam's deviation from Islam's true, true value of tolerance and peace. <clears throat> I'll just have to skip over some to maximize the time. Uh, the second approach here, in the discourse over militant Islam's jihad, could be categorized into apolog apologist for militant Islam's violence, disallowing its normative conformity to Islam's holy war. These are, Muslim, these are mostly Muslim religious institutions, right groups, and public intellectuals. So the argument here I make, just I survey how do the Muslim, in particular, intellectual community responded to the connectivity between jihad and violence. So these are the, the, basically the schools of, of thought that we have. Uh, so here I argue, while such a response has intrinsic value under the current states of perpet perpetuality of violence, their realism is undercut by each new outbreak of militant violence. So the argument I make here is religious ideologies are only addressed through religious arguments. And more substantial argument against modern jihad can be actually actualized within the Muslim traditional argument against jihad. The diversity within Islamic scholarship, which SSC ham uh, Humphreys characterized as cultures of scholarship has a tradition of contesting the validity, the validity of jihad by the sword. And henceforth, I use jihad for this physical jihad. There is a well-established Sufi scholarship against the per permissibility of jihad. Furthermore, recent Muslim scholarship has contested jihad not by defending its rhetoric as justify violence, justify violence, or even corrective violence, but as a religiously invalid in time of space. Sufism has been central in sustaining an Islamic voice against jihad, embodying Muslim tradition and interest in offering a buffer zone through which other peaceful means could be advanced. For example, here uh, I skip over something. Uh, we can look at uh, the which I'm trying to do here, uh, look at the last century, 20th century, and survey uh, treaties that written by Sufis in particular to object, again, to criticize jihad. So the argument here is theological as well as political argument against jihad. Example of Sufi scholarship here, I talk about three major books that have shaped our perception of jihad in Islam. One of them is uh, uh, Sheikh Ali Abdul Ra Razik, who is a well-known Egyptian scholar who wrote the book Al-Islam Usul al-Hukum uh, in 1925. It's a long story be behind what happened to this great Sheikh. But his argument was, actually, his, also his book focused on the Khilafah, to criticize the Khilafah, within that criticism, he dismantled the argument of jihad. But in Muslim history, the, ex, the, the, the establishment and maintenance of the Khilafah institution has been organically linked to the declaration of jihad. So his ability to dismantle, to, de, to denounce categorically the validity of Khilafah of the, the, of the Prophet Muhammad was summed up by his criticism of jihad. That is, it is no wonder that the Turkish caliph in Istanbul was against him when the book was published. The second example here I want to talk to about briefly is Sheikh, whom we often call Usman, uh, Ustaz, Muhammad Mahmoud Taha of Sudan. He wrote his book, Ar Risala Sani Amin al Islam, published actually in 1961, the first edition. And uh, in his book, Sheikh Ustaz. Uh, 
Muhammad Mahmoud also categorically dismantled the argument of, of jihad. What his argument in the book is, there are two messages, Risalatani fil Islam, two messages in Islam. The first message in which the Prophet accepted jihad and used it. But in Islam, we know there is something called Nasir and Mansur. So that first stage of Islam ended. With it ended the argument of jihad. Therefore, the second argument of Risalat Islam as the second argument, the mess of Islam started, in which jihad has to be, uh, has to be uh, nullified. Anyway, my, the third argument in this book is the subject of our talk. It is Sheikh Musa Kamara, 1864 to 1945. So that is the case study I use uh, for this moment. Sheikh Musa Kamara, I'm trying to summarize this so we can maximize the time. Sheikh Musa Kamara's work belongs in this sphere of Sufi's objection to jihad. It singles out the futility of physical jihad and call for endorsing a theology of peace as jihad. Certainly not in pleasing colonial authority, but for the true understanding of Islam. He notes that, I'm quoting him, I have seen many scholars from Futa Toro and beyond, and each one of them liked jihad, which is today disruptive. It is not a jihad where death is a, is a joy and martyrdom. Today, anyone, I'm still quoting him, who pretends to be a scholar only thinks about jihad, as if he were a prophet of God who has been given the divine order to fight jihad under its condition. End of quote. Born in a traditional Futa family in Futa Toro in 1864, Sheikh Musa became, became a prolific and widely acclaimed writer in Arabic. We have accounted, I mean here I, for accounted for 48 manuscripts in his personal library at his native village of Gangul Suley, Salihu, where I spent this summer a week with his uh, grandson. Salihu Drame, another re researcher, has offered a detailed listing of 15 full-length treaties of Sheikh Mosa Kamara at Ifan Sheikh Antajob University. This corpus of variant context knowledge encompasses African history and civilization, ethno-anthropology of West Africans, tribal heritage of the Fulani, to poem and poetry. Sheikh Musa is original in his thought and style, also influenced largely by Arab and Muslim scholars such as Ibn Khaldun and Jalaluddin Asyuti. His style is marked by, by an acceptance of oral histories as a valid source of local history and an untainted logic in embarrassing his subject and analyzing the, rash, the rational behind their behaviors. Among his most prolific, among his most, uh, if just remind me when I have five minutes, uh, among his most profound Sufi treaty, Sufi threats, in, uh, in his vision is his vision of human cohabitation and his understanding of Islam as primarily an abode of peace. The three towering corpuses that mirrors that mirror his Sufi spirits are uh, Qada al ittifaq translated as Islam and Christianity. Aksaru Raqibin, Moswanabi Jihadis, that is my translation of this book which was partially translated into French by uh, Professor Ahmed Samb and the Condamnation de la Guerre Saint. Hiwar al-Mazahib, another book, tra I translated as dialogues between Sufis, Sufi orders. In analyzing his book, Al-Haq al-Mubin, Khadim Bakke of Ifan, has argued that the Sheikh believes in borderless approach between Sufi orders, where disciples are free to circulate between orders and adopt different words. Eventually, in this late book, Sheikh Musa attempts to create 
space for a peaceful cohabitation between Tijaniya and Qadiriya orders among the orders. It is true that the decline of Qadiriya from 15th century onward has contributed to the rise of Tijaniya, especially in 18th and 19th centuries. The contentious relationship prompted Sheikh Kamara to criticize any usage of jihad to settle this rivalry, including the jihad of Sheikh Omar Fudi. Coming up here. Sheikh Kamara is a writer with brilliant clarity and expanded imagination. This is methodologically reflected in his little, in his titles of his books, as they tend to reflect long names and descriptive sentences. Also, his treatise against jihad is commonly translated as condemnation of the holy war. The original Arabic title is more than 21 character long sentence. As in most of his books, the title communicates a definite statement on the problem at hand, the purpose of the author, and the significance of his proposal. This book, Arabic, which we read earlier, tells the reader, tells the reader the author's categorical dismissal of jihad, not as a valid religious virtue in its theological context. This is very important. Sufi, they don't dismantle jihad. They don't reject it in its historical context, because it did exist, the prophet did fight jihad, but as a valid tool to settle any socio-political conflict outside its prophetic history. Written between 1924 and 1926, the book is divided into eight chapters in addition to the, intro to the introduction part. It is a common perception among analysts that the last chapter of the book, which is a part of the original manuscript but not in the published Arabic copy, was added later, in late years. The final chapter is about his personal life, his correspondence with the French administration, especially Henri Garden and Maurice de, de, de La Fosse. The later French Africanists is widely praised in the book for his promise to translate into French Sheikh Kamara's book, Zuhur al -Basatin. The eighth chapter of the book represents the most ardent refusal of the concept of jihad as practiced by al Haj Omar Fouti six decades earlier. There is another dimension to Sheikh Musa, Musa's approach, knowing the risk of an outright dismissal of jihad among the ulama community, the Muslim scholars, Sheikh Kamara draws his argument against jihad from three sets of intertwined evidence, Quranic verses, the prophetic tradition, and the acceptance of Muslim scholarship. This triangulation of evidence reflects vigorous scholarship, erudition, yet a strict adherence to his wet person, wit personality. His last point on his personality is relevant in understanding his work he was able to separate between his personality as an objective res researcher from his personality as a Fulani Muslim believer. al Hadi Omar Fouti, whom he used as a central character in characterizing the practice of jihad, is also from his tribal group, the Fulani, his homeland, Futa Toro, and his jihad was often framed as a Fulani onslaught against the French colonial administration's remaking of the traditional power they power dynamics in this region. Its late development, as we all know, was the subject of Sheikh Hamidou Khan's, Sheikh Hamidou Khan's contention uh, in uh, Sheikh Hamidou Khan's book of 1961, Levanter and Bigay. I'll just read a few more pages here. This example, chapter one, is about Sheikh Musa's Sufi spirit and personal refusal to join any call for jihad. Sheikh Musa starts this chapter with his statement upon the request of some of my acquaintances who are known with scholarship and authority that I support them in their jihad. I did not accept their call due to my ascetic 
life choice, not by pretense, but due to my in indifference in this world and my lack of interest in political leadership. Sheikh Musa then recount, <coughs> yeah, I'll leave that out. Okay, Sheikh Musa notes that among the prohibition of Among the causes of his refusal of jihad is Islam's attitude toward killing. To support this claim, he draws on Muslim history and specifically on the earlier days of the conflict between companions of the Prophet. So he talks a lot about what happened when the Prophet passed away in, 19, in uh, 632 and the conflict that happened. And each side used jihad to fight it as an evidence. Uh, okay, I will read the third, the, basically three frameworks focusing on the Quranic verses, the hadith of the prophet, and the third framework here, I'll just read this, and one paragraph from the conclusion. The third framework of Sheikh Musa Kamara against the validity of jihad is in his belief in the separation, in separating the two spheres of politics and religions and religion. He notes that a state cannot be erected solely on religion and piety, but rather on politics with trick and intimidation. End of quote. His argument debunks the logic of jihad which is fundamentally advocated based on holy cause, not a strong political case. Sheikh Musa postulated that the success of non-religious, non-pious Muslim leaders in politics is a part and a parcel of Muslim tradition. That's a great point he's making that, well, we accept the Muslim history. If you look at it, we have good and bad Muslim leaders. So he made that theological link to argue that this is valid, not a valid cause to kill others. I will read one paragraph, and that is the end of it, in the conclusion. <coughs> Sheikh Musa Kamara's dismissal of jihad is original in its Sufi context and content. Sufism does not object to jihad based on its historical validity, but they often contest the merits of its continuity and the logic of its politics. We have noticed in this paper this communality in the work of Ustad Mahmoud Taha of Sudan and Sheikh Ali Abdul Razik of Egypt. Sheikh Musa expands the argument in its religious as well as logical scopes. If many Muslim scholars' critic of Al Haj Omar Futi Jihad is based on the fact that it, its last and most brutal victims were Muslims and from the Masina uh, Imamate of, Ham, of, of uh, Hamdullahi, Sheikh Musa's criticism is unbound. He does not condone El Hadi Omar's Futi's conquest against his fellow men, whether animist Bambara, Muslim Mandinke, or Christian Frank. War, he argued, in the name of the faith, cannot be justified for the sake of political dominance. Thank you very much. Oh, no.